Thank you. So, uh, hi, my name is Alex. I am a master's student at the Technion. Uh, this is work done together with Itai Eyal. And today I'll be presenting Ostroka. This is how you build scalable blockchain nodes. So, our talk in this talk, I'll uh, cover the scalability problem, present our solution, evaluation, and conclusions. OK, so let's talk about the scalability problem. This is what we're all here for. Uh, current blockchains don't scale well. And one of the reasons they don't scale well at the moment is a consensus problem. So a bunch of smart people got together, uh, came up with many possible solutions for the consensus problem, whether it is uh, Bitcoin NG that says, let's decouple leader election from block creation, or some sort of BFT protocol that enables us to achieve consensus on many transactions fast. So while this happens, we are starting to see new bottlenecks. We still want nodes to be able to process, store, and propagate transactions across the network. So all of these uh, can or will become bottlenecks in the future. So let's see how, what are the current solutions that are trying to mitigate these problems. So one of the solutions that you have heard of a lot about today uh, during the sessions is sharding. So this is what sharding generally looks like. There are uh, committees. Nodes are being assigned to, the, assigned to them. Each one of the committees is running its own uh, sort of a subchain. Sometimes they need to interact with each other. And uh, we get a higher throughput, and nodes need to store less because uh, you, each node uh, only needs to be, to be allocated to one of the shards. So there are plenty of examples that you have seen uh, here today and we'll see later on. Uh, but these uh, solutions have several limitations. First of all, shards can be brittle. Uh, some people talked about it, that uh, if the hashing power is split between the shards, one of the shards can be compromised. So now you're corrupting a single shard and by this way corrupting the, full, the whole network. Another challenge is the challenge of cross-shard transactions. We, the throughput in the increases. We would, li would likely see more and more transactions that need to communicate between shards, and this becomes a performance problem as well. Another solution that is not the main topic of this workshop, but should be mentioned as well, is layer two solutions. So with layer two, two you open a payment channel or a state channel and communicate between two parties. Now, not all the transactions need to go on the blockchain, so overall throughput increases. Not everybody needs to hear, needs to hear everything. But layer two solutions have some limitations of their own. First of all, they are suitable mostly for long-term transactions, for micropayments. Uh, and if I want to buy a cup of coffee, I would still need to probably do a, a transaction on layer one. And Usually, they require additional security assumptions. If, uh, for example, you're using a Lightning Network, then you need to have some kind of deposit on the blockchain, and you can't use it for anything else while it's there, or trust a trusted execution environment. So our motivation. Uh, so we wanted to look at this problem. We said, OK, so let's say we want to keep the security properties of existing solutions, for example, resilience to 50% adversary. We want to, of course, increase the, the network's throughput. This is what we're all here for. And uh, additional ideas are that uh, most of the users can be using light clients, also has been mentioned here today. Many light clients that uh, interact with full nodes and people who have interest in running a full node, such as miners or exchanges or financial institutions, will have the finance to run a full node and the interest to validate the whole chain. So if this is what uh, blockchains look like today, a single chain with small nodes running and validating the chain, this is the sharding solutions that are proposed, has been proposed, uh, basically splitting the, the chain between shards and uh, having small systems running on each one of them with the 
uh, drawbacks and that we have mentioned. Uh, and what we are saying is, OK, let's run a single chain that's very secure, have big systems running the full nodes. But to make it more accessible, to keep it open and, uh, and available, what we're going to do is shard the nodes themselves. OK, so we're going to be using the term sharding, but we're not sharding the blockchain as in the classical way or as uh, others have uh, talked about it, but we're going to be sharding the actual node. OK, so uh, this is where uh, our solution comes in, Ostroka. So the meaning of the word Ostroka is shards of ancient uh, pottery and uh, clay vessels. Basically, we wanted a different word that means sharding, but... <laughs> OK, so the challenge is with uh, building such a system, we need to split all the storage, uh, need to split all the data structures that are needed to keep a blockchain. We want to split the validation effort, and we want to split the network bandwidth uh, between the shards that we are building. OK, so how are we going to do this? Uh, so each one of the nodes in this uh, system will, be, will have some components a coordinator and shards. So the coordinator uh, connects to the network, orchestrates the P2P connections, talks to other nodes, and the shards, they are the workers. They store the blockchain and the UTXO set. Uh, they uh, talk to each other if they need and validate transactions. Now, all of these entities are part of a single node, OK? There are no trust issues between the shards or between the shards and the coordinator. So uh, it's not like the, one of them is trying to be malicious. How does it look like uh, connected? OK, so in this example, there are, there are coordinator and four shards that you see. Each one of the shards is assigned a shard index uh, by the coordinator when it uh, connects to the node. And the shard index will indicate which part of the blockchain this shard needs to be responsible for. OK, so shard 0 will be storing and validating all the transactions that, for example, start with 0. Uh, all the shards know all the other shards. They're all interconnected. So if a shard is missing some information, he knows who he, can, who he needs to uh, go to to get this information. OK, so how, two nodes, how do two nodes connect to each other? Say node B has just joined the network. The coordinator of B talks to coordinator A. They exchange information. They understand what are, who are the shards of each one of them. And the shards can now connect to each other. Um, the number of shards in each node doesn't have to be the same as long as they know exactly who they need to talk to, who they need to connect to. And in the whole network, uh, you, can, you can be connected, of course, to mo more than one node, just like now. And we can run uh, gossip protocols, etc. So let's look at how uh, block validation works in uh, such a system. Let's remind ourselves what a uh, block in the UTXO set model looks like. So the block has a header. It has transactions. And this is a transaction. The transaction has a transaction uh, hash. The hash is uh, generated by a pseudo-random SHA-256 function and is evenly distributed. The, sh the transaction has outputs, which tells us who uh, and how much money that we want to pay. And it has inputs that reference previous transactions and the index of the output from the previous transaction that we actually want to spend. OK? So let's say we have a system with two shards. So now, instead of each one of the shards storing the full block, each shard will store a block shard that will only have the transactions that are relevant to that shard according to the shard index, as we explained before. Great. Uh, let's look at how a um, block would propagate in the network. So in this example, there are two nodes, Alice and Bob. Each one has two shards. And say a a node A has just found out or mined a new, a new block. Oh, sorry. 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 <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, okay. Sorry for that. Just at the crucial moment. Or do plug this. Hmm? This one? Yeah. Yes. Which page? Um, some more. Uh, no, go down. Yeah, this page. This, this one. Okay. Sorry about that. Hardware is tough sometimes. Great. Uh, okay, so we were at how does a block propagate in this uh, network? So a, a node A has just found out node A has just found out about a new block and wants to propagate it to node B. Okay, so coordinator A informs coordinator B that a new block has been found. Coordinator B informs his shards that a new block has been found. And now each one of the shards from a node B contacts its appropriate shard from a node A and requests the block shard that are relevant for this block. Node A, each one of the shards on, uh, from node A send the appropriate block shard to node B, and now we'll uh, look at how node B begins to process and validate these transactions. So uh, let's look at node B. Okay, so node B has shard zero, shard one, it has some, uh, some inputs, and we said that the transaction hash is evenly, evenly distributed, so we would expect that in this case of two shards, about half of them won't be in the UTXO set of shard zero. If we have uh, n shards, so n minus one over n of them won't be in uh, shard zero, and he'll, he will have to request this information from uh, shard one. Now, uh, he knows exactly who he needs to uh, talk to to get this information. So shard zero requests the information, the signature, the script uh, from uh, shard one. And if everything is okay, uh, shard one sends this information. Now shard zero has all the information he needs to validate the block and uh, can continue validating the transaction and the next block. If there has been uh, some kind of a problem with the block, if uh, shard one does not have the UTXO or it has already been spent, or if the signature is somehow invalid, each one of the shards can in inform the coordinator that the block is invalid and disregard the block. So uh, great, uh, let's see if it works. So we've uh, implemented it in Go, we forked it from uh, forked the implementation of a uh, Bitcoin client written in Go because we wanted to see actual bottlenecks that we are running into and not just a simulation. We ran it on uh, EC2. So in the following experiment, you'll ha uh, what we'll see is uh, each one of the components will be this system of two cores and four gigabytes of RAM. Not too big, but this is what we want. So in the experiment, there will be uh, two nodes talking to each other. Each one of them, uh, of the shards, and the, the coordinator himself is a system, like I said. Uh, and what we are going to do is uh, change the number of shards and see if we can get better performance. So first of all, we started off with a single shard, single coordinator. The shards talk to each other. This is uh, quite similar to a system, the, a reference uh, client that uh, cannot scale out. Uh, and uh, what we see, obviously, as we increase the number of transactions in a block, each one of the transactions is about 250 bytes. The time to process the block uh, grows, obviously. We need to validate the signatures, we need to access the uh, data structures, and this takes time. Uh, okay, 
So let's see how it looks like with the two shards. Great, uh, we are already getting some kind of uh, an improvement. It takes less time to process the same number of transactions. And uh, to evaluate uh, how much do we benefit from adding more shards to such a node, what we wanted to look at is uh, a certain uh, time limit. We took 10 seconds and say how many transactions can a node of such a configuration uh, process in 10 seconds. Uh, the idea is uh, if we want to keep the system secure and to keep the number of forks uh, low, we want each one of the nodes to be able to process enough transactions fast. This is how we can uh, increase the throughput of the whole network. So we took 10 seconds. This uh, number can be, can be changed according to parameters of the network, uh, uh, time between blocks and block sizes, etc. So uh, continue testing this with up to eight shards in this, uh, in this experiment. And what we wanted to look at again is basically where does the line of 10 seconds uh, intersect each one of these lines to know how, much, how many transactions can a node process in 10 seconds. So uh, these are the results. Uh, you see three lines here, okay? Uh, first of all, there is the reference, uh, the reference client that we were using. Obviously, it cannot scale out. We cannot just uh, tell it, okay, process more transactions now. Its capacity is what it's got with the given uh, hardware. Uh, the blue line, that's, uh, that's Ostroka. This is basically, uh, again, how many transactions this node can process in 10 seconds. And happily, we can see as we add more shards to such a node, it can process more transactions. The green line is the optimum. Basically, uh, what, if, what would happen if we took the reference client, somehow automatically tell it, now you are two nodes, and uh, there would be no uh, overhead of running an inter-shard inter protocol. So the differences are about, for a system with a single shard, we get a difference of about 8%. We can process 8% uh, less transactions, and uh, this makes sense. We have additional uh, protocol overhead. For two and more shards uh, in this experiment, the overhead is uh, slightly uh, bigger, about 12, but it stays uh, constant as we increase the number of shards. And obviously now we have inter-shard communication as well, so some additional overhead will, uh, will have to be paid. Okay, so uh, let's conclude. We wanted to uh, build a system that keeps the security properties of, of uh, existing solutions. We say, okay, uh, let's look at sharding a bit differently, uh, not by sharding the blockchain itself, by, but, but by making it possible to build uh, nodes that can scale out as the network throughput demands it. So we are not telling everyone, let's replace your hardware, but you can add more hardware and May, may still be able to process as many transactions as you need. Uh, and uh, this solution basically utilizes the properties, the nice properties of the UTXO set that can be very parallel and uh, we can be applied to other solutions as well if you need to build scalable nodes for that. So um, this is uh, still a work in progress. Uh, there is an implementation and uh, paper in the works, but it will be coming soon. We still have some more kinks to fix and some more uh, features to add. Uh, so this is it. Thanks for uh, the organizers for letting, letting me have this talk. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alex. That sounded really interesting. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a question right there at the back. If we have a microphone. Or, uh, it's coming, yeah. Hi. Um, I wonder how does, does affect the fact that uh, one of your shards not, doesn't have in, so let me, let me do it again. So if one of your shards doesn't have a certain UTXO in their set, how does it affect the... Uh, um, again, I, I didn't hear you. So if you have a shard, that doesn't have uh, some UTX or in that set, right? Yes. And you're trying to uh, validate those outputs. Yes. And they don't have it. Right. Uh, how will it affect the system? He accesses, he asks the shards that he does, that does have it, uh -huh. 
uh, because it knows its shard index and knows the transaction index. All so right. he knows exactly who he needs to access, uh -huh. gets the UTXO set from them, and validates it. And, all right. Great. Uh, we've got a question over here, please. Uh, hi. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, forgive my newbiness, but um, I was wondering uh, uh, how and if can it, uh, it can recover from a, a critical mistake. So say, for example, one of the, of the shards, you, you, so you have this coordinator and an A and a B, cool. Uh, what, if, what if B fails for some reason? Okay, so uh, basically, yeah, each one of these systems can fail, uh, like in every other system that we are looking at, and it will take time to recover, but each one can be connected to several other nodes, so one node that falls doesn't crash the network. You're still connected to the other nodes, and you can get your information from them. And, and so there's no data loss of that? There is no data loss in the network. I mean, this, the shard will need to recover. He, need to, he will need to come back online, ask what has happened while I was online, while, while I was offline, uh, get the information that he's missing, and continue working. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, great. Were there any further questions? We've got a question over here. Uh, maybe I'll bring the mic. That's fine. Um, have you looked into like more than eight charts? Like, yeah, yeah, we've looked at uh, more, like up to sixty. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe at several hundreds it will start to slow down. But at several yeah. hundreds. I guess I have I, I've run up to sixty. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, any further questions for Alex at this stage? Oh, we've got a question at the back there. Sorry, um, could you maybe explain some more about the security model between communication between about? the nodes? And the security model, basically, b with okay, communication so between the nodes and the controller? So nodes, the separate nodes, they don't need to trust each other. They, are, uh, they can send each other invalid blocks and the receiving nodes need, need to validate it. But the shards in the single node, they, are, they belong to the same, to the same person. They, they're the same entity. So there are no trust issues between them. There's no shard that will try to fool you that uh, he has an unspent uh, UTXO that has already been spent. Okay? Thanks. Thanks.